The year is 1962. On board the ocean liner Antonio Graza, the passengers are having an evening of dinner and dancing to Francesca's music. A little girl, Katie Harwood, sits alone, not having as much fun as the others. Afterward, the captain of the ship asks her to dance with him, which she accepts while everyone enjoys themselves. Someone is lifting a lever to unravel some wire. When the spool finally snaps, it makes the wire whip on the dance floor, bisecting all the passengers and crew except Katie, whose height allowed the wire to pass above her head. Forty years later, we meet a crew of salvagers, Captain Murphy Maureen Epps, Greer Dodge Munder and Santos. They're rescuing a ship that is taking too much water, so Greer isn't sure they can carry it on for much longer. It was also very hard to find, so Ops refused to give up on it. Using a wire to move between ships, she enters the rescued boat and finds a punch in the port floater, ignoring Murphy's warnings. Epps starts working on repairing the hole as Munder and Dodge join her to help hammer on a piece of metal that the men weld. Some hours later, we learned the group was successful in their rescue when Murphy brings their pay to their table at a bar they're celebrating when they're approached by a man named Jack Fairman who wants to hire them. Fairman proceeds to tell them his story. He flies the Arctic Weather Patrol flights out of Mackenzie Bay, and last month he was in the middle of the strait when he saw something. He showed them a picture of a ship in the Bering Sea, which he tried to contact to no avail, so he figured it was adrift. He told the Coast Guard about it, but since the ship was in international waters, they only took note of it. He never caught the ship's name, but he saw it again. A few days ago, Fairman only asked for 20% of the findings and promises. He hasn't told anyone else about it. Murphy asked for a minute alone with his crew after Fairman left. The crew discussed whether he should take this job or not. Greer was hesitant because they'd already been out for six months, and this would take them another week. He hadn't seen his fiance in a long time. When Murphy promised an even split, Everyone accepted to go, and Greer gave in as well. They called Fairman over and told him they'd give him ten. He accepts under the condition he goes with them. They set out in their tugboat at sunset, but it isn't until later in the rainy night Santos is at the will when he sees something on the radar. So he calls Murphy the radar shows nothing when the captain arrives. So he thinks Santos imagined things, but seconds later the radar shows something again. Murphy calls Epps to join them, and after she arrives he tries to contact the mysterious ship, while Epps notices how it shows up and out of the radar by the second. Suddenly, the large ship appears in front of them, so Santos has to quickly stop their boat. They don't fully crash, but the engine gets damaged. They circle the liner to check it out, and Murphy is surprised to see the name Antonio Graza. It's an Italian ship that was reported missing in 1962 off the coast of Labrador, but the strange thing is there was no distress signal. It just disappeared. Since then, every captain has been looking for her. But now that she's theirs, they bring their ship closer so they can board her. Greer Santos and Fairman stay behind while the rest of the crew goes to investigate. They take note of the condition details of the liner, like life preserver lockers being empty and lifeboats being gone. When they find a door, they go inside, which makes Greer lose his connection to them. The crew walks around different rooms, commenting on the fanciness. When they hear a noise, they follow it and find a pendulum clock still ticking that startles Monder. When it strikes time, as their laughter echoes in the ship, they move on to another room on a nearby table. Katie's old toy moves on its own and misspells welcome aboard the tugboat. Greer is bothered by the lack of communication, but in the liner, the crew keeps going without worrying much. They enter a lower level of the ship and keep looking around when suddenly the floor breaks under Munder. Epps grabs him and prevents him from falling, but he's left hanging, and she's brought down to the floor while desperately crying for help. She sees Katie through the hole, but she's gone in a blink. Luckily, Dodge and Murphy catch her, pull her, and muddle up before they get hurt. Moments later, Murphy finds that the compass and the helm are dead, and Dodge notices the fuel tanks are empty. The ship must have ridden on until she was dried. Murphy finds log documentation on a desk, which he intends to take back with him, and on another table, Dodge finds a digital watch, which doesn't make sense because they didn't exist in 1962. Murphy thinks they aren't the first ones to find the ship, but it doesn't matter because it's theirs now. So he orders everyone to go back. They'll start the towing in the morning. The crew returns to their tugboat, and the fairman asks them if they were able to find out what happened to the liner. Murphy says it's a very good question, and tells them the story of the Marie Celeste. Ship that went through the same thing as the Antonia Granza. She was found empty, with no crew or passengers and no signs of distress. She traveled for miles at full sail with nobody at the helm. Fairman calls her a ghost ship, which Dodge scoffs at as they discuss their plan. 
Afterward, Murphy wants to tug the liner along as they usually do, but Santos doesn't think their little tugboat can pull such a big ship. Greer mentions they could anchor her and come back later, but Dodge says that Russians could steal her from them, and Murphy points out that the anchors are gone anyway, so Greer agrees to get the engines working and drag her with a tugboat, which will take them two weeks, but he doesn't mind since this will pay extremely well. Meanwhile, Apps can't stop thinking about what she saw when Mundo fell. Fairman comes to check on her since she's been very quiet, and Epps confesses she saw a girl on the ship, which is impossible. Fairman tells her he also sees things sometimes when he's been flying for too long, and she finds his words comforting. The next morning, the crew goes scuba diving to check on the state of the liner's hull. They confirm she has a hole and is sinking. She probably got hit around a week ago back inside the tugboat. They discuss their options. The ship is caught in a strong current loop that has been slowly pushing her towards a nearby group of rocks. They must fix her before she gets hit again. They have three days to do it, but Munder mentions all the things they need to work on and points out that three days aren't enough. Santos also thinks he doesn't have enough gear to fix the engine. Murphy orders everyone to do it anyway. When Greer says he's going to call this in following marine law, Murphy forbids it because he doesn't want any guests. Santos stays in the tugboat working on the engine while the rest of the crew boards the liner to do a full recon before they start working on the repairs. They divide the group into pairs to work on different areas. Greer and Murphy are together, but Murphy doesn't allow Greer to enter the captain's room with him when they find it. Munder and Dodge are going through a flooded lower level heading to the main engine room. When they realize they're unable to use their walkie-talkies, Epps is supposed to be with Fairman, but she seems to be alone when she finds a room with a swimming pool. She gets inside the pool and finds holes on its walls, plus bullets on the floor. When she decides to leave, she starts to climb the pool stairs only to find Katie at the top. Startled, she falls back into the pool and loses consciousness. In the meantime, Greer continues to look around while Murphy checks out the captain's room after finding the captain's hat. He checks the bathroom where he finds blood and a razor on the sink. The other members of the crew are finding weird clues as well. Greer sees the elevator has fallen, and when Dodge and Munder make it to the engine room, they discover it's totally flooded. They try to tell the others, but all they get is static on the talkies in the pool. Epps is waking up unaware that the blood from her head wound is being absorbed by the holes on the floor. She asks Katie to wait, but the only person there now is Farriman. He helps her get out as a different hole on the wall starts spouting blood back in the captain's room. Murphy finds a glass of whiskey, and when he's about to drink it, he looks up and finds that the reflection on the mirror is not his, but the liner captains are startled. He drops the glass and leaves the room, while the mirror shows the old captain again. Meanwhile, Farriman and Epps discuss what the bullets could mean as more holes start spouting blood, filling the pool with their bodies. As Fairman and Epps leave, suddenly Francesca's singing can be heard over the walkie-talkies, while Griera follows the voice into a dining room. The pheromone and Apps find the central laundry, and Epps decides to check if the vent is flooded. As soon as she opens it, a strong wave of water comes out, further flooding the room and revealing bodies that can only be around a month old. As the door closes on its own, Epps tries to contact Murphy to tell him they should get off this ship, but the talkies aren't working. They try to leave the way they came in, but since it's locked now, they take a different side door. Meanwhile, in the dining room, Greer finds a piano on the stage, and on top of it an ashtray with a cigarette that is still lighted and has lipstick on it. He also admires a picture of Francesca, unaware that she's watching him from afar back to Fairman and Epps. They're moving through a hallway when Fairman suddenly enters a room, excited to find an old car. Epps tells him they should go, but stops when she realizes there's something moving under a pile of mailbags. They kick the bags off and open the box under it, revealing a bunch of rats that start a lapse, and most importantly, many bars of gold as they leave the room. Epps tries to contact Murphy again, but on the talkie only, there's only static and a strange voice that calls out her name and asks for help because it's cold. They keep moving and find the galley Epps decides to open the fridge, even if Fairman warns her not to. She enters the fridge and is suddenly jumped on by two people inside meat bags that chase her out and back to the galley. These people turn out to be Dodgers and underplaying a prank app interrupts their laughter by telling them about the bodies in the gold. Moments later, the whole crew has reunited and gone to the cargo hold to open the rest of the boxes. They all contain gold bars. The crew immediately starts celebrating their newfound fortune, but Greer is worried they may be insured. Dodge points out that the markings have been filed down, so the owner must have wanted the bars to be untraceable. Greer thinks it's stolen, 
and Murphy thinks this may be why the ship disappeared. Munder says that explains 1962, but the bodies they found are recent, which causes Greer to confess that he heard a woman singing, making the others laugh at him. Epps proposes to call the Coast Guard, but Dodge points out they could be in equal trouble if the gold truly was stolen. Murphy reminds them that anything found in international waters is a finder's keeper, so they agree to take the gold and leave the ship behind. Greer and Santos go back to the boat while the others get the boxes ready. As an invisible force opens a propane tank in the boat's engine room, Katie appears in front of Epps and warns her to stop what they're doing, but it's too late. Another ghost pushes Katie away as Greer starts the boat, causing the engine room to explode. He jumps into the water too, and he manages to rescue Greer. While Fairman appears by her side, having found Munder, Santos is nowhere to be seen, but Katie's observing from afar. A few moments later, the crew is back in the liner while Epps tends to Greer's wounds. Dodge gets angry at Fairman for not having investigated this ship better and tells him it's his fault. Santos is dead. He intends to punch him, but Greer stops him. Afterward, Epps goes to the deck, where Murphy is sitting alone and blaming himself. She tries to comfort him, but he just silently leaves. Epps returns to the room with the others and tells them they should try to repair the ship so they can return home or at least survive until they're rescued. Greer would rather build a raft, but Munder thinks it's not a good idea, so he asks Apps to wait until morning to start repairs under good light. The next scene shows that the crew is back on board. The two crew members are bold, and they find some canned food. Munder tastes a bite, and finds that the taste of canned food is not bad, so the two begin to eat heartily. Suddenly, Munder sees something squirming in Dodge's mouth. Now they realize that what they had just gobbled down are disgusting maggots. At the same time, the drunken Greer, dazed and confused, comes to the hall. He suddenly finds everything around him is restored. In an instant, he goes back to that night 40 years ago. The red-clad singer appears in front of Greer and the bewitched Greer. Greer follows closely behind the singer, step by step towards death, the result of losing his footing, falling down the elevator shaft, and dying. The captain feels guilty about the helmsman's death, and he goes to the captain's room and picks up the suspicious bottle of brandy, intending to drink his sorrows away. Half asleep, Captain Antonia appears in front of him. He tells the captain that 40 years ago, they were on a ship named Lorelei, from which the boxes of gold originated, and that there was only one survivor. The captain sees this person's photo and is shocked. On the other hand, Julie comes to a guest room, where the room is full of dolls and ladies' clothing. She opens the closet, and there is a corpse hanging inside. At that moment, the spirit of the little girl appears behind Julie. The girl tells Julie that everyone on the boat is dead. Most of the souls have returned to their homeland, leaving only their marked souls still trapped in the ship. Before the girl can finish her sentence, she is taken away by a mysterious supernatural force. Knowing the truth, the captain tries to inform the team to leave, but he comes halfway to see the dead helmsman, who comes to claim his life. Hearing the sound, Julie rushes over. At this time, the captain seems to have been cursed in general and feverishly attacks Julie. But luckily, the timely arrival of Jack knocks him out. To prevent the captain from going crazy again, he is locked in a water tank to calm him down a little. The rest of the group opens a self-help plan, working together to repair holes in the bottom of the ship, start pumps to pump seawater out of the hull, and repair the rudder to control the direction. Late at night, Julie meets the ghost girl again. To let her see what had happened 40 years ago, the girl touches Julie. For a moment, the scene is like a movie from 40 years ago. When the gold is brought on board the Antonia, a group of robbers starts to kill in order to get this huge wealth. They kill the chef, poison the food, and then use steel locks to cut off the crowd on the deck, and the rest of the people are not spared and are taken to the pool and shot en masse. Even the little girl is not spared and is hung in the closet. For the sake of money, all people have become demons. Greed has blinded their eyes. Tempted by the singer, this man kills all his accomplices, not realizing that he has just turned around and is also killed by a shot. At that moment, a man appears in the darkness. He is the mastermind behind all this. After hugging and kissing the songstress, he uses the preset organ to silence her and marks her hand. Julie is overwhelmed when she sees the face of this mystery man, and he is Jack. All this is his plan, to trick them onto the ship to kill all of them. Julie realizes that the captain is in danger, but it is too late. The captain has already drowned alive. The photo he is holding is Jack's, and meanwhile, 
The tragedy is still unfolding. In the water to repair, Munder is strangled by the gears. When Julie arrives, only Munder's mutilated body can be seen. The matter is removed from the disguise of Jack, revealing the true face. His eyes fall fierce, step by step, to Dodge's approach. As a result, he is shot by Dodge. Of course, Jack would not be so easy to kill. Julie realizes that as long as the ship still has existence and filled with gold, there will be more people dying from death. So he installs the bomb in the cabin, intending to let this collection of cursed gold, followed by the entire ship, sink to the bottom of the sea. Just then, Dodge arrives to stop Julie, completely unconcerned about whether Munder is still alive. Julie sees right away that the man in front of her is not Dodge. After the disguise fails, Jack turns back to his original form. He is a soul reaper. He uses gold to tempt those greedy people, and all evil souls will be marked. When he collects 1,000 souls, he will be reborn. While Julie is distracted, Jack suddenly knocks her into the water. Julie picks up the harpoon gun in the water, and instead of aiming at Jack, she aims at the detonator switch. With a loud bang, the tanker Antonia is blown up. Jack also participates in the violent explosion in the ashes, and Julie is still trapped in the boat. At the critical moment, the girl in white reappears to guide the direction of her escape. Countless souls come atop the surface of the sea around the slowly sinking Antonia and fly into the sky. Next, we see Julie is rescued by a passing cruise ship. In the ambulance, she sees the heavy boxes of gold being carried on a new cruise ship. Julie sees they are followed by Jack walking at the end and screams in terror when her ambulance door closes.